understand for a second. Um, when is yes? When is that this? What time is it? Do we know? How are we feeling? Yeah. Awesome. 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 Awesome
like my grandma's literally on Facebook all the time. Like, like our, our, one, that is a fact of, of our community. We, we're online now. I think if you look at the percentages, like we, our presence online is very high. And so I leverage that, right? Like if I'm looking for a story, if I'm looking for opinions, I, I ask, you know, what, what do you think about this? And do you want to participate in the story? Like let, let's do it. And that that's a, a different strategy, you know, that, that is sort of working. So we're gonna queue up this clip, um, and this really goes into, again, the intersectionality of how we're telling the stories and what the impact is in the Latinx community. This is, you know, I think Paola is bringing to light conversations that might be difficult for our communities to have. Um, and this clip specifically, I don't know if you could share a little bit before we, we roll it out. Yes, um, so this is so this is a, a series that I started with, with Vice Media. Um, when Vice, all of a sudden, a little bit later, realized that in order to be relevant, no, they had to target the Latino community. They had to. Um, so we started a show called Latinx. Um, and again, it's about telling these like untold stories within the Latino community um, and going beyond the border, right? Like what are Latinos all across the country living, right? What it's not just immigration, um, it's, it's, it's many other issues. So this is a story that, um, that took place in the Central Valley of California. And the reason we ended up doing it is because one of my good friends um, that I went to school with, you know, she told me, there's people in my family and that are hooked on meth, and I was like, and then I kept asking her, and she was like, yeah, this is a reality for many in the Latino community in the Central Valley, right? So when we think of the Central Valley, when we think of California, I was only thinking about LA and San Francisco, and I would always drive by the Central Valley. You know, I never looked to the right, to the left, because those were my two destinations, but when you stop, and you, 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 re you realize you know, all of these issues that, that the generation is, is going through. Great, so we're gonna go ahead and show that clip. So meth is still a huge problem in this country, and that's something that you can really feel right here in Fresno, California. traditional place for a lot of methamphetamine over the years. What are the faces you've seen? Mostly Hispanic. Never been a worse drug. It truly impacted us because we started dealing with Mexican drug cartel traffickers. That started the epidemic. On a typical Saturday, how many syringes do you see? 20, 21,000. I have personally seen a higher rate of Latinos infected by this drug. A lot of us always say meth must be a hell of a drug because people give up everything for it. What a health emergency, and they're not addressing that. Their war on drugs didn't work. Here we are, this is the front line. You know, we're talking about something crazy, the laws on this. But honestly, I don't think you can help anybody that's not ready to be helped. Some people call Fresno a crater. It's really difficult to leave once you get here. You know, you would think that you would stop and see your kids and you would quit. But when that drug and demon has a hold of you, it's hard. Yeah. Powerful work. Like, that's a, that's a powerful story that we're not seeing. How many of you knew about this happening in the valley? Yeah. And then this is just, oh, we have a hand over there. So there's like three of you. You know, you, we should talk to them because I'm sure that their stories are powerful enough where we need philanthropic partners to come in. They need partners to come in and support and think through solutions of how do we how do we do this together? How do we work together? Right. And that's an ongoing crisis, right? That's not you. That's been going on for for years. And I think the to me the story is like there's so many people that would look at these drug addicts and, and think of them, and there are no people look at them and think that they're criminals, you know? But they're not, they're victims. You know, that, that to me is like the point that these are people that the system has failed them. And we would talk to so many of them, farm workers that took meth because they had to work crazy hours, a young Latinas that were depressed because they were separated from their families. Like, you know, it's the reality, you know, the, the pain that a lot of people in the community are feeling. And unfortunately, yeah, it's not a nice video. So, Paula, how did, how did we get here? How did we get to this moment, you know, where I feel like Latinx has really kind of came up 
you know, I think it's been around, it has been around in the community for a while, but now that it has a limelight. So how, in, in your opinion, how did we get to this moment? And so for me personally, so before before this, this type of work, and I I was in the world of pop. I was in DC all, for years. You know, I lived here for five years, and you know worked worked in worked right around here. And, and then I did the Hillary Clinton campaign, um, where I was the deputy director of Hispanic Press. Right, it sounded super fancy, um, and we spent like almost two years doing exactly that, trying to reach um, the Latino community, trying to get them to vote, trying to get them mobilized, trying to connect with them. And I remember. When we lost, um, when we lost the election, it, it hit me that we had done it almost all wrong. Then, because we spent 80% of our time only on Univision and Telemundo, speaking in Spanish, trying to reach that community, and not one time in the two years that I was working for her did we mention the word Latinx. No, did we look? Did we did we think about like who are we missing? No, what are the stories like? When we go to these states, like who are in the corners and like what are the young people doing? And why don't why weren't we talking to them in English? Why weren't we talking about like other issues? And that's when it hit me that that's why I wanted to do this work and really focus on understanding what it means to be Latinx. I don't think we have an answer clearly. Like I think that's that's the problem, you know, that we're still trying to define and figure out like what we're about, what we care about, and what issues matter to us, how to define us time and time again, like the one the one thing that always strikes me is like we can't ever get it in the same page at all. Like, what do we call ourselves? I, every time I travel, like people will say, "No, I'm white." No, no, I'm I'm brown. Like the whitest person will tell me that they're brown. The brownest person will tell me that they're white. And I think it's very telling. And, yeah. So I'm like, but I think that's that's the beauty of where we are now. We get to. I think one of the one of the conversations that you and I had, had was that when we look at the current administration, they're winning on the narrative hard, right? Like across the board, whether it's like the HUD guy or. The education lady. I'm not going to say that. Um, so, um, I don't want anybody to get mad at me. So, um, but across the board, their narrative is on point. On any channel, on any anything that you see, on on it, it's always on point. And I think for us, like you're saying, we, we you can't define us. Like you know, um, we have we have these different kind of, and it's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing, right? In this moment of self definition, but it's also why we also, I think, are getting hit so hard in this moment with this anti-Latino narrative, mm -hmm. right? Um, part of your work, I, too, I think, as well, is that it's not just like the Latinx narrative, but I think also challenging our traditional behaviors, I think, of communications, mm -hmm. right? So as, as part of your work, you, you're on Vice, but you're also on Telemundo. Mm -hmm. So in part of your work with Telemundo, what is your goal in being able to like talk to that audience? How are you talking to that audience? And, and how are you also challenging these narrative issues yeah. there. Right, because I think as important as it is to figure out what Latinx means, I think I think it's even more important to try to with the demographic that we know, to try and challenge them and to try and get to, to try and break stereotypes within us, no? And so when I started with Telemundo, and I was I always think about this, the first time that I went on Telemundo, they were like, Okay, get there like twenty minutes early, we're gonna do your makeup. I was like, All right. And <laughs> so they sat me in a chair. And because they're used to Latinas looking a certain way, they <laughs> literally stop me. And 20 minutes after, I look like a completely different person. <laughs> like my lips were like red to here, eyes, like, and I looked at myself in the mirror, and I on it like this is super cliche, but like I didn't recognize myself. I was like, wow, like this is not what I look like. But sure, like I guess I'm going on Telemundo. <laughs> and my mom saw me, and she's like, what the hell is that? <laughs> no, but then, but that's when after that day. I promised myself that I would never, ever, ever look like they wanted me to look. No, it's just like, 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 like traditional like Latina box and talking about the issues that they wanted me to talk about. So ever since, like I use, and they've been very open to this, and that's why I value them a lot. But if, but every week I use it as as a way to make that audience feel a little bit more uncomfortable, right, or expose these issues. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's because that's the only way, and expose issues that they're not used to talking about, um, but you know, you slowly start talking about issues that, that you know, your, your abuelas don't want to talk about. And, and I think it works, slowly. Yeah. Well, and I think we're also seeing that with the rise of Azteca Media, yeah. right? Where they're like, oh, there's, a, there's an English-speaking Latino audience. And yeah. Like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, we're going to see them soon. Um, but I want to I wanna show this next clip that you did with Telemundo, because in this clip, you are specifically really calling out the way that 
um, you know, Yeti Zapparizzi had come out with Roma, and the backlash that all of a sudden we saw. Yeah. So if you could talk a little bit about that before we wrap oh, up. Oh, yeah. Hey, again, we, just because we are Latina doesn't mean that there's no racism. That doesn't mean that we have to, that we don't have to work on so many things. And we saw that with Yeti no? where this beautiful person was all of a sudden called all of these names by us, you know, Mona, Silvienta, no sé qué, just because of the way she looked, because people didn't, understand that, that that is beauty too. Like she is part of our community. So we just, yeah, we did a little segment on, on, on her, but I, again, I think it, it represents the time that we're at. Right now. I'm gonna show you that clip. Hace poco mencionábamos aquí la película Roma de Alfonso Cuarón, el éxito que está teniendo en cada lugar en donde se estrena y sobre todo por su protagonista, Yalitza Aparicio, una joven maestra indígena de origen mixteco que nunca antes había actuado y a la cual la crítica hoy alaba. Pero ha surgido un lado muy oscuro de parte de la comunidad mexicana. La han criticado y se han burlado de ella en las redes sociales, no por su desempeño, sino por su físico. Paola Ramos, un gusto que estés aquí para hablar del tema que la verdad da vergüenza. Yalitza apareció en unas fotos de la revista Vanity Fair. ¿Qué cosas se dijeron en redes sociales, por ejemplo? Pues tengo que decir que yo he descubierto una cosa que siempre lo he pensado, ¿no? Y es que una de las grandes hipocresías que existe dentro de nuestra comunidad es que no nos gusta ser víctimas del racismo, pero entre nosotros mismos, entre nuestra comunidad, practicamos el racismo, ¿no? Y eso es lo que vimos en estas fotos. Cuando Vanity Fair saca estas fotos, hay usuarios latinos que la llamaron Mona, India, Chacha, decían que tenía la piel de color de caja de cartón. O sea, estos fueron comentarios reales. Entonces, la pregunta que yo tengo es que si en esas portadas hubiésemos visto a Sofía Vergara o a Salma Hayek, ¿cuál hubiese sido la reacción de esas personas? ¿Cómo lo hubiesen llamado? Yo creo que bella. Entonces, ¿por qué es que cuando Yalitza sale en esas portadas no la podemos asociar con la belleza, la inteligencia, el triunfo? O sea, ¿por qué nos cuesta tanto? Totalmente. You know, I want you in this moment to really be able to kind of say to this group, whether we have philanthropic funders, whether we have nonprofits, organizations, about what is it that we have to do in terms of being able to rethink the Latinx narrative and how are we engaging in communities? Um, what do you think are some of the ideas that we can use to be able to tell these stories in a way that's powerful, that in a way makes an impact and is able to kind of be seen by those that need to be seen? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just a matter of like looking outside of this room, no? looking outside of DC. And I'm learning by the day, but the one thing that I am learning is, for instance, I just took a trip to the Midwest. No, when I was I was doing research on like young Latinas in the Midwest, I would have thought that that doesn't almost exist. And every time I would talk and I would meet these young Latinas, they would tell me, "We feel invisible. Like no one comes here, no one is looking at us." I spent almost two weeks there. They have so many answers. Like there's artists that are thinking completely differently about what it means to be an activist. No, there's there's people in music in Milwaukee that are like fusing hip hop and Latino music and are just being so innovative. So my my biggest takeaway just from the work that I've been doing is to to think outside the box and to look at all of these young Latinos that are all across the country that have many of the answers that we're trying to figure out, right? And, and they're out there. Uh, one of one of the things that I was trying to do during the midterms um, was figure out how do you get how do we get like young Latinos who now you know the, the the polling tells you most young Latinos identify as independent. That says a lot about um, where we are politically, you know, where they, where no one is really like not yet. They don't they don't feel any allegiance to any party. And so how do you get them to to even see themselves in the community to use their vote? And so instead of knocking on doors, which is the most important thing, and I used art. No, I, I found an artist and we went across the country and we just took this like massive photo booth truck to like 20 cities, 25 cities across the country. And we, we, we used art and we used these photos um, to take pictures and register people with the simple like idea of look at yourself, 
in the city, this is your voice, and use it. So it's just thinking, like, just trying to think outside the box. Yeah, and I think, I think one of the conversations that we had too is that understanding that like the Latinx Latino narrative doesn't fit within one specific thing. So I think if people are coming and explaining these problems that exist or persist in the community, to listen, right? Because these are, these are things that are happening that you might be like, oh, but of course look, you know, don't do math. And it's like, well, actually, you know, so I think being able to think and, um, you know, really listen to the stories that are rising like organically, I would say. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, that, that is right now, and I know I saw a doctor somewhere, but like from Undocumented Black, but um, that is like the Afro Latinos, the indigenous Latinos, like the, the young Latinas that, uh, that feel, I mean, that feel left out, like they, they're driving a narrative now, and, and all we have to do sometimes is listen. Um, that's it. And I will say one of the things, before we show this last clip about that thinking outside the box, is that millennials have surpassed baby boomers in terms of voting, right? And the majority of millennials are Latinos, Latinx. Yep. And so that number alone is like, there's about to be a big shift in yeah. how we choose to frame these conversations and how we frame these narratives are gonna be really vital to what 2020 and beyond looks like for our community. Um, but I wanna show this last clip of the work that you did with, um, out of, I just messed up the name. Oh, inside out. Inside out, sorry. Um, so we're gonna show that clip, and you're almost too much, hang in there. I wanna support every gamer out there, everyone that's going through the same thing. What we're trying to do with this project is use art as a means to show people the real stories and the faces and the voices um, behind dreamers, right? So that people understand that they're not just political talking points or a bargaining chip or something that people see on TV, but that they're real human beings. Is this is my face, right? This is who I am. I am a dreamer. This is my story, my voice, um, and I contribute to this city. Well, my life's at risk. Um, I have, my family's undocumented. I support the dream. I, I'm a dreamer. So for me, it was essential to come and support this. I'm actually a, a doctor recipient. It's allowed me to live a, a normal life, really. to create the next generation of leaders in philanthropy and Latinx leaders in philanthropy. We just selected our 2019 class of Libres. If you're in the room and you're a Libres, can you just stand really quickly? to run for office. Ooh. We need y'all to run. Um, you can sign up. Now, it's, I'm going to say it, but you know, it'll easy to remember. bit.ly backslash hip Latinas, all lowercase. Sign up. We want you to run for office. It's your time. Don't even think about it. Even if you're kind of thinking about it, it's your time. You're going to do it. <laughs> um, but thank you so much. We are going to clear the room for lunch so that we can get you ready. We're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to feed everybody. So thank you so much. Thank you, Paola. Enjoy the conference. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our session. We will now take a 20-minute break to prepare for our 